2 Peter chapter 2, verses 17 through 22. I'll go ahead and read the text for us, guys. <clears throat> These are springs without water and mist driven by a storm, for whom the black darkness has been reserved. For speaking out arrogant words of vanity, they entice by fleshly desires, by sensuality, those who barely escape from the ones who live in error, promising them freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit and a sow after washing returns to wallowing in the mire. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just ask you today for your Holy Spirit, for the, for the help of of your Holy Spirit, Lord, to help me uh, clearly communicate what, what is here in your word and, and to give us all understanding um, wh wherever it is we're at, Lord, whether we need conviction, encouragement. Um, Lord, just, just meet your people where they're at, God, through the, through the uh, illumination of your spirit, God. And just and help me as well, Father. We love you and praise you. In Christ's name, amen. <clears throat> So the title of the message today is The Deadly Fate of False Teachers. We finish in chapter 2. And uh, so that's what we're going to see. We're going to see that very thing, the deadly fate of these men. Uh, have you guys ever noticed the ripple effect of uh, you throw a little rock in the water? We call it the ripple effect. Um, we, were, we were at Lake Thunderbird the other night with the Browns just taking a walk. Now, I don't know that we ever said that, but we noticed that. A few fish jumping up, and the water was so still, you know, you can see any type of splash. It could be a little pebble that big, but that's what we, we all know the ripple effect, right? The ripple effect, especially when you're, when you're dealing with very calm water. Did you know sin is like that? Sin has a ripple effect. It really does. Uh, things that we do in this life, choices we make, it has a ripple effect. It affects that it doesn't just affect us at that time. There's, there's a ripple effect to sin. It has deadly consequences. Sometimes it has deadly consequences to those around us. It affects other people. You know, you think of, uh, obviously, and that, that would apply to every person. Where, where I'm going with this is, in the final judgment, God has taken everything into account. All the ripple effects of our sin. You think of something real, you know, really graphic, but, but very clear, easy to understand. Think of somebody like the pornographer. Think of somebody who has made a living of distributing this kind of stuff and all of the lives that have been wrecked because of it. The families that have been destroyed or the, or the, 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 the drug pusher or the, the, the alcohol distributor. These type of things, they're going to stand before God and give an account. And he's, going to, he's going to take the ripple effect into account. All the lives that they have destroyed and so what we're going to see today, guys, that's true of these false teachers. That's true of these false teachers. We, we've been looking at their character. Uh, you know, so we talked about last week, we, we, uh, just maybe what some of their false teachings were. And we've looked at their character in different ways. Um, but, but we're going to see their effect on other people today, even more so. And, and really how all of that affects their, their final fate. That's what we're going to see today. Because these false teachers, that very thing is going to be true. False teachers, like we've talked about, they destroy lives. They bring eternal consequences. Eternal destruction to, to people's lives. And we'll see today as well, you can be a true, genuine believer and have your faith shipwrecked by false teachers. But God... As we saw, his judgment's not asleep, and these men will face their uh, their deadly fate. So, on your bulletin, if you have your bulletin, on the back, 
um, this proposition I have for you today. And it's just a proposition statement. It's, it's trying to, to get your mind engaged um, these, these statements that I have at the top. And today, it, it's this. You know, we're, we're told to be aware of false teachers, right? And that's, and that's why Peter's writing this. That's the context of the letter. He's wanting these readers to be aware of false teachers. So it's the same with you guys. Same with us. So we're going to see in our text today, guys, that you can, be, you can become more aware, okay? You can become more aware of false teachers so as to avoid, sometimes we're called to avoid them, and rebuke them at different times. You can become more aware of false teachers so as to avoid and rebuke them by understanding four things we're going to look at today. Four things. First of all, you can be more aware of false teachers as to avoid and rebuke them by understanding that, first of all, in verse 17, part A, that they make empty promises. They make empty promises. The title of the message originally was going to be false teachers don't deliver. Because they don't. We're going to see that. But that's just the first part of it. I thought I would, I thought I would change the title to really where the sermon's headed. But they don't. They don't deliver. They make empty promises. So guys, bear with me without my glasses. <laughs> I've got to like, I've got to stay. I can't get too close or everything gets blurry. So the, so the letters are really small. So there may be times where I have to look for a minute to find out where I'm at. But the, the first thing we see that you guys need to be aware of is false teachers make empty promises. That's what we see in verse 17a. Peter says, These are springs without water and mist driven by a storm. I think Jude said it even clearer. They're, they're clouds without water. That's what Peter's saying here. We have to remember who these messengers, who their father is. They're, they're, the devil is their father. The devil is a liar. Okay, He's a liar and so are his messengers. And he says there's springs without water. Or your version may, see, may say a well without water. Very simple to understand. You're expecting water. <laughs> One thing you expect when you go to a well is water. And when it doesn't deliver, that's very disturbing. It's very, very disappointing. You know, we, we think about water. He, he took such a clear example, something we can all understand as water. We need water. You guys have been real thirsty at times, right? There's nothing better than water. Some of you guys might like Dr. Pepper. Some of you might like Coke or whatever, sweet tea. But when you're really, really, really thirsty, nothing even compares to water. I was thinking of that and thinking, man, when, when do I remember being the most thirsty? I remember football practice. Justin, you remember that? <laughs> and I just remember the water being... And, and, and you could... Think of an era, a time in your life. Maybe it's women working out in the flower beds, whatever it may be. Maybe it's a different sport. Carl running, Jamie basketball. It could be whatever. I remember football practice in August, getting the water break. And, oh, yeah, I mean, there was nothing like it. The cold water they would have for us. Imagine expecting that, and they turned the water on, nothing came out. That's what's going on here. That's what these false teachers are like. Wells without water. Springs without water. It reminded me of Howard Snellenberger back in the mid-90s. Coaching at OU. And he failed to give them water. And literally it almost killed a player. He was trying to be old school. But yeah, we don't, we don't have water. And what do we, when we, go to a, we go to somewhere to get a drink to, to turn the faucet on. We expect water. These men are springs without water. There's springs without water. Um, you know, water's meant to quench your thirst. It's very, very, very simple. They, and these men let you down. They let you down. They, 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 they claim to have something for, for the people of God. They claim to have something, but they, they don't deliver. This is the way of the false teaching. False teaching and false teachers. They don't deliver what they say. Matthew Henry says this. He says, Ministers should be as wells or fountains where the people find instruction, direction, and comfort. The man of God who's supposed to be teaching the Word of God is supposed to deliver these things from the Word of God. 
But it's very, very simple. I mean, why, why, how can the minister truly be a well as a well or fountain like, like Matthew Henry says? Because of who it is we're pointing towards. We're, we're pointing towards Jesus Christ and what He says in His Word, who is the, the living water. But these men don't do that. They don't point towards Christ. You see, the true man of God preaching what the Word of God says, again, he's going to point to the promises of the Word, of the Savior. He's going to point the lost to the Savior. Listen to what Jesus says about Himself in Revelation 21.6. It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. And so the true man of God points people to the water. But these men don't do that. These men don't point people to Christ. Remember how we've talked. They, they, they try to exploit you by their false words. They're charlatans. They're frauds. They offer, they offer false hopes. And we'll, we'll talk about some of those in a little while. But that's what they do. They offer false hopes. Whether it's riches. Whether it's perfect health. They offer, but they can't deliver because they're not even teaching the truth of God's Word. Jude 16, which we read a while ago, speaking about the false teachers, said they flatter people for the sake of gaining an advantage. And we've talked about that already throughout this chapter. That their motive is greed. Their motive is greed. The very ones they're supposed to be caring for, they're taking advantage of. That's who these men are. And then he also says they're missed. The NAS says they're missed, driven by a storm. Uh, the, the New King James phrases it, clouds carried by the tempest. In other words, there's clouds. But they're driven by the storm. They're, the clouds are carried by the storm. What do you expect when you see rain clouds? You expect rain, right? But that's what these false teachers are. They don't deliver. They're like a cloud that's supposed to bring rain when you're in a drought and it just goes on by doesn't deliver. Imagine being a farmer, right? You're paying attention to the weather and the clouds, it looks like it's going to rain and then they just blow on by. That's who these false teachers are. Clouds which yield no rain. They have nothing to offer, guys. That's what Peter's saying. False teachers don't have anything to offer. They certainly don't offer the living water, which is what our souls need. They're not, they're not only void of the truth, no water for the soul, but like a drought to the farmer, through their deceit, they bring destruction. So not only do they not offer what our soul needs, they actually bring destruction. They lead people to hell. They shipwreck faith. They, they, they deceive. And that's what these men are. They don't deliver. They offer empty promises. That's the first thing Peter is saying here in this verse. That's what, these, that's what this language means. Just empty promises. Secondly, what you guys need to be aware of is they entice the weak. They entice the weak. Verse 18 and 19a. They entice the weak. And we'll come back to 17b at the end. Verse 18, it says, For speaking out arrogant words of vanity. Arrogant words of vanity. We'll stop there. They speak arrogant words of vanity. They, they fool people. You guys can probably think about maybe false teachers you've seen on the television before. They, they can fool people with their supposed great biblical knowledge. And a lot of times they have great speaking skills, right? They're very good speakers. They're very charismatic. And they could come across with, with supposed biblical knowledge, authority, even scholarship. If you're, if, you're not, if you're not discerning and understand what the Word of God says, these guys can be very impressive. But they're arrogant words of any. We've already talked about how arrogant they are. They can even claim, what do they claim? And if you're a young Christian, you got these men saying, I got direct revelation from God. You hear that kind of stuff a lot. Lots of charisma. Great speakers, these guys are. But they're full of empty, boastful words. Albert Barnes says this very little short statement here. He said, truth is simple and delights in simple statements. The truth, you don't need to 
You don't need to try to make the truth all fancy. The truth is very simple most of the time. Very simple statements. You can communicate truth. But these men have lofty, arrogant speech. That's what the language is. And see, the, the, this, this first phrase here in verse 18, speaking out arrogant words of vanity, just again, empty words, meaningless words. But that's their hook. They can hook you with their, with their, with their arrogant, lofty speech. They can hook you. And then we're going to see just in the next few words, but lust, sensuality, really a license, that's their bait. See, they, they hook people with their charisma, I guess you could say, and they bait people, really pull them in, as we're going to see in this very next phrase. It says, for speaking out arrogant words of vanity, they entice. Remember we looked at that word last week, I believe. It's, that, it's the word where we get baiting the fish, right? The fish that's not aware. Baiting or, or uh, fishing or hunting. Right? You're trying to trap your prey. Your unsuspecting prey. That's what, that's what these men are doing. And it says they do so, they entice by what? Fleshly desires, by sensuality. That's their bait. With great charm and charisma. False teachers offer what our sinful flesh desires. Have you guys noticed the huge crowds that follow them? John says don't do not love the world or the things in the world. The lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, boastful pride of life. That's exactly what false teachers offer. Things that appeal to the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Some of them might phrase it as your best life now. You guys have probably heard that, right? Your best life now. Everything that your lustful flesh desires. That's what God offers you. Especially if you send in your money. That's how they work. That's how they operate. They're teaching, and specifically these men that Peter's been describing, that teach a license to sin. Your, your old life, right? Your sinful life really, really wasn't that bad. There's really no need of repentance. Your life's not that bad. If you, if you notice these false teachers, if you pay attention to them, they don't speak about things like holiness, repentance, judgment. That's none of their language. That doesn't fit with the big crowds and the money and their motive. As we'll see in chapter 3, there's no final judgment. It's not about sin. It's not about repentance. It's not about living a holy life. They may, they may just tell you, just add Jesus to your life. Just add Him. Add Jesus. Because they do, they do come in the name of Jesus. They may say something like simply ask Him into your heart. There, there's no demands of repentance and holiness. In other words, He's going to fix your life. Jesus Christ is going to fix your life. That's who we're here representing. You can have all your needs met. Your best life now. He, he'll, he'll, he's going to fix all your problems. If you have enough faith, there's always that end of it. If you have enough faith, you'll have all your finances met. All your health needs will be met. And Jesus is all about... You see, the Jesus we offer, it's all about love, love, love. Right? Love is love. What's the definition of love? Love is love. Love, it's just love and grace. And they twist these terms. We don't judge anyone here. That's, that's a lot of the language you'll hear. There's no judgment here. Bring all of your sin. And, 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 and it's just love. That, all of this, it's just, it's, just a, it's just a false gospel. Is Jesus love? Of course He's love. But the one who is love demands us to repent, to turn from our sin, and to follow after Him. So they'll use a lot of the same, the same language that, that, that you hear in a, in a, in a true Bible-believing church. But they twist it. It's a license. A license to sin. And again, this stuff is appealing to the world. Okay, This kind of 
lofty language, these kind of carnal promises appeals to the crowds. It appeals to the world as compared to the man that is simply proclaiming the demands and the promises of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's not near as appealing. No, now we're, now we're trusting in God to draw His people to Himself. We're not enticing the world with fleshly lusts. Even Jesus experienced this. Do you remember reading in the Gospels, Jesus had huge crowds following Him. Thousands. But what were they after? They were after the miracles. They were after the bread. After the food. After the healings. Because Christ would turn to those following Him and say things like, if anyone wishes to come after Me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow after Me. For whoever desires to save his life now, that's your best life now, whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for My sake and the Gospels will save it. And what did 99% of the crowd do? They left. This was Jesus Christ. And that happened to him. You can read it in the Gospels multiple times. He would turn and say things like, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he's not worthy to be my disciple. The crowds didn't like hearing that. Now, understand, he's not teaching us to hate our family. Okay? We know that he's simply saying that if you're going to follow me, then even your love for those closest to you will seem like hatred compared to your devotion to me. That's all he's saying. Obviously, he doesn't call us to hate our families. But the demands of the Gospel are there. And they would even forsake Christ. Christ would have had a little bitty church. is what He would have had. He had just a few disciples. The crowds would abandon Him. What was His message? Come and die. That's the message of the true Gospel. Come and die. Come and die to yourself. Come and die to your sin. Come and die to, to your dreams and your goals and follow Me. And then you will receive eternal life. That's the promise. You're going to face temptation. You're going to face persecution. But you're going to receive eternal life. You're going to receive a new heart to where you'll have new goals. New dreams. It's not that we don't have dreams. We don't have goals. But He makes us into brand new creatures in Christ Jesus. And then He grants us the desires of our heart. Because He puts new desires in our heart. We're not following after Jesus Christ. We're not following after the lust of the flesh. Or the lust of the eyes. And it says they entice those through, in verse 18, they entice by fleshly desires, by sensuality, those who barely escape from the ones who live in error. Now obviously, because there was a little debate in who, who these people are who barely escape from the ones who live in error, obviously they're going to deceive. False teachers will deceive the unregenerate. They're going to deceive those who are not born again. They're going to, it, it, it said many follow them. Many follow their sensuality. We saw in a few verses previously. So those who are not yet regenerate are going to follow them, right? And their false gospel. And they're going to follow them down the wide gate that leads to destruction. But I believe this is referring to this phrase right here in verse 18. They entice by fleshly desires those who barely escape. I believe this is talking about the young, immature believers. That phrase barely could be could be translated just recently. Those who just recently have escaped from the ones who live in error. The ones who live in error just means the world. Okay, Just those who live in error. These ones who just recently escaped, just recently were delivered from darkness, just recently came to Christ. They entice these. They corrupt. They entice Young believers. 
Now, in Peter's day, it could have been these the, the, coming out of the air of Judaism, or if they were Gentiles, just out of the heathenism of, of the Gentiles. But these new believers, these men entice and corrupt young Christians, on top of the unregenerate who they lead astray, away from the true gospel. It's like this, beloved. It's just like a wolf or a lion, right? Who's seeking their prey. Have you watched the... Remember the nature shows? You see the lions, right? Who are they always when you see a lion approaching a herd? They're always looking for the weak one. They're always looking for the one who maybe is isolated. And they, and they, or they pounce on them. That's what's going on with these men. They prey on the weak. They entice the weak. Listen to 1 John 2 verse 14 real quickly. John addresses this issue. He said, I have written to you fathers because you know Him who has been from the beginning. I have written to you young men because you are strong and the Word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. This is just talking about different levels of maturity of Christians. But listen to what he says. I wrote to you, young men, because you are strong and the Word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. These are men who are strong in the Word of God and who can stand against false teachers, for example. Because why? They're strong in the Word of God. As compared to verse 12, he says, I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven. Yes, the young Christian, their sins are forgiven, but they're not yet strong in, strong in the Word. And I believe that's what who's, Peter's referring to here. These false teachers, they entice young, immature Christians who are not grounded in the Word. And that's why Paul tells us in Ephesians 4, that's why we need teachers, right? So you're not tossed to and fro. But these, these men... These men who are strong in the Word, it would be like verse 12 in, um, back in Peter. Verse 12 in chapter, uh, chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12, it talks about those who have been established in the truth. Those who are established in the truth are not going to be enticed and swept away by false teachers. So they, these are the ones that they, they, that they entice. The weak. That's the nature of a false teacher. They're bullies. They go after the weak. And it says in verse 19a, still, still under point number two, enticing the weak, it says they prom- they're promising them freedom. They promise them freedom. This may be part of their arrogant words of vanity that he's talking about. Making promises of freedom. Freedom in Christ. They may be using some of this very language, right? Freedom. It's all about freedom. We're free here. What's their, what is the freedom they're talking about? Do whatever feels good. You're free. Again, Angela, that video you sent me. You're free. There's freedom here. It's just love. There's no judgment. What is their idea of freedom? It's a freedom or a liberty to sin. That's the freedom of the false teachers. You're free to sin. Free to sin. A license to sin. Right? Free in Jesus. You're free to sin. There's no, there's no judgment to worry about. There's never anything about your old life, how you need to be born again. Repent. Be made new. Flee from your life of sin. Follow after Christ. It's a freedom from having to obey God's law. Antinomianism. Freedom from obedience to God's law. A license to sin. Paul says that we're free from the law. Okay, That's what Paul says. He says we're free from the law, but what does he mean? When Paul speaks about being freed from the law, we have been freed from the law's Curse. You understand that? As Christians, we were under the curse of God. But what happened? 
Jesus Christ redeemed us from the curse by becoming a curse for us. So we're no longer under the, the bondage of the law, the curse of the law, the penalty of the law. We've been freed. And now we're, what are we freed to? Not to disobey the law. We are free now to obey God's law. You see how they get everything backwards. You and I are now free for the first time in our life since coming to Christ to obey God. Because we couldn't before. We had no desire before. We had no ability before. We were in shackles in our sin. But now we've been set free from the penalty of the law, from the curse of the law, and from the power. We've now been we're free to, to obey. These men get it backwards. Paul said in Romans 6, verse 6, our old self was crucified with Him so that we would no longer be what? Slaves to sin. We're no longer slaves to sin. Okay, we're free from sin's power. These men say, no, you're free to sin. Doctrines of demons is what this is. John 8, 36, so if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Amen? Do you think that that phrase actually means when Jesus Christ sets a person free, He sets you free to sin all you want? No! He, not, he doesn't set you free to sin. He sets you free from sin. Big difference. Big difference. Not to sin, but from sin. Jesus Christ sets People free from the power of sin and the penalty of sin and someday the presence of sin. And these men say, no, 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 don't worry about that. Bring your sin. It's all love. No judgment here. That's doctrines of demons. It leads people to hell. It'll lead people to the very end of the wide gate just to hear, depart from me. I never knew you. I had nothing to do with you. You're a stranger to me into the eternal fire. And so like predators, beloved, the second point is they entice the weak. Okay? They entice the weak. So we need to be aware of this. Like, like John says, we need to be strong in the Word so that we can, number one, have enough discernment to avoid them. Right? You don't want to get mixed up in it. Avoid them. And there are times that we can lovingly Rebuke them or warn those who are caught in their teachings. But we must be strong in the Word of God to do so. Thirdly, you can become more aware of false teachers so that you can avoid and rebuke them by understanding that they are enslaved to sin. They are enslaved to sin. Peter has given us, through the inspired through the Holy Spirit, right? The inspired Word of God. Really a description of false teachers. And, and so why is this so foundational to understand that false teachers are enslaved to sin, beloved? Because when the Bible refers to a false teacher, it's somebody who's unregenerate. These aren't Christians. So of course they're going to be enslaved to sin like any other unbeliever is a slave to sin. We might, we might not always see it, but you can mark it down. If it's a false teacher and they're preaching a false gospel, they're enslaved to sin because they're not a believer. Okay? Sometimes it'll manifest itself. But we have the Word of God right here. They're enslaved to sin in verses 19b through 22. It said, promising them freedom, they themselves are slaves of corruption. They are slaves of corruption, slaves of sin, we, we saw that last week in verse 14. Remember, eyes full of adultery. Meaning, they can't even look at a woman without lust. They lust after every woman they look at. And they never cease from sin. They're slaves of sin. Slaves of corruption. You know, compare that to Job. I don't have the verse noted. But remember when Job, it says, made a covenant with his eyes? That's a picture of the man of God making a covenant with your eyes that I'm not going to allow myself to look at anything impure. See the difference? What a contrast. These men are slaves of sin, but as Peter described himself in verse 1 and chapter 1, and all believers, we are slaves of Jesus Christ. 
Okay? They're slaves of sin. If you're in Christ, you're a slave of Christ, a slave of righteousness. It says, for by what a man, in verse 19, slaves of corruption, for by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. This phrase right here, it's, it's taken from military law. And it simply means this, guys. When one is conquered by another in war, he is no longer a free man. He's no longer a free man, but he is a prisoner of the one who captured him. These men are prisoners of sin. And what's, but what's sad is they think they're free. They speak about freedom. But they're prisoners of sin. And if you're not in Christ, this applies to all who are not in Christ. You're a prisoner of sin. You're a prisoner. And you're awaiting execution. Prisoner of sin, awaiting execution. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. In verse 20, it says, For after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They, we're still talking about the false teachers. The they is referring to the false teachers. The, the same ones that are the slaves of corruption. This entire section is about the false teachers. And it says they, they have escaped the defilements of the world by, by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is not a saving knowledge that this knowledge is referring to, but simply an outward reform. Okay, It's a profession of faith. We've seen that in this chapter. These men at one point... You could say that they were within orthodoxy. Okay? They had made a profession of faith. This is, this, is, this is the idea that men get religious. And yes, for a time, they can escape outwardly the defilements of the world by just getting religious. That's what these men are. But there's no, there is no grace going on here in, at work in the heart. Okay? There's no grace. There's no regeneration. Not a saving knowledge. It's the knowledge of Titus 1.16. They profess. These men profess. They profess to know God, but by their deeds, what? They deny Him. Being detestable. They profess Christ, but their lives are detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. This is not a saving knowledge. This is an outward knowledge. And it says this, they are again entangled. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome. That phrase that they are entangled, beloved, it just simply means they return to their old sins. They return to their old way of life. Not the picture of the Christian who is now wrestling with sin, right? We're doing battle with sin. These men have completely returned to their old sins because there's no regeneration. There's no new birth. And it says they become entangled once again. It's like backing into a giant spider web. I picture Frodo on Lord of the Rings. Do you guys remember that? The big spiders and getting tangled up in the webs. That's what this means. Being entangled in these webs that they had escaped from and just backing up and being entangled all over again. They are not overcomers. These men are not overcomers. Listen to 1 John 5.4. Because I think it's very important. It describes saving faith. 1 John 5, 4. For whatever is born of God, right? Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Our faith. Those who have been given genuine saving faith back to the very beginning of the letter will overcome the world. Will not be entangled again back into the world. 
Doesn't mean you won't struggle with sin. But we're not going to go back, as we'll see, like and 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 like a sow returning to the mud. Revelation 2.11, speaking of the overcomer. I just want you to see how this is all connected. The overcomer, who is the overcomer? Revelation 2.11, Jesus says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. This is the Christian. This is the Christian who perseveres. Why? Because God preserves us. Because our faith is a gift given from God. He started it and He'll finish it. He began a good work, He'll finish it. These men are not overcomers. These men are frauds. These men are charlatans. And it says the last state has become worse for them than the first. What is this describing? Apostasy. These men are apostates. They apostate, apostatize. It just means to fall away. To abandon the faith. It's the language. He gets. There's no doubt Peter would have gotten this language here. You don't have to turn here, but the words of Christ in Matthew 12, 43-45, listen to this. Now when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came, and when it comes, it finds it unoccupied, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and takes along with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself and they go in and live there and the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. That is the way it will will also be with this evil generation. It's almost as if Peter's saying this this truth is being fulfilled. Simply Jesus is saying without digging into that text, moral reform without the new birth is deadly. People that get religious without the new birth is deadly. Because without the new birth, they're lost. And they're they're even more deceived. And your heart can become harder. That's what Peter's saying here. These men, their last state has become worse than the first. This is apostasy. This is... Somebody, now only God knows those who truly, who are apostate, but an apostate has no hope left. They have no hope. We'll look at that here in a minute. In verse 21 it says, he goes on to say in verse 21, for it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. It would have been better for them not to know the way of righteousness. That just simply means means that their sin is greater. Because of the knowledge of the truth they have, their sin is greater. Their condemnation is going to be greater. It's not excusing ignorance. But for people who sit under the preaching of the Gospel week after week, year after year, If there's, not a, if there's not repentance, they're heaping up judgment. It's becoming worse. And these men, even greater, they speak in the name of God, as we'll see here in just a moment. Having, in, in verse 21, it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteous than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. What is the holy commandment? It's just simply the gospel. The truth of God's Word. The Gospel in the language of Jude 3 that we read earlier. The faith. The contents of our faith. Beloved, while I was making every effort to you to write about your, our common salvation, I felt it ne- a necessity to write to you to, uh, appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith that was once for all handed down to the saints. That's that language here in verse 21 to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. The idea is receiving the gospel. We receive the gospel with the purpose of then teaching it to others and defending it. These men are not doing that. First of all, they never received the gospel. 
They never had a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And they're obviously not teaching it. They're teaching a false gospel, void of repentance, void of judgment. And they're certainly not defending it, but perverting it. Can you see why their judgment will be so severe? Can you see why their, their last state is... They're in a worse place now. This is apostasy. Listen to New Testament scholar Michael Green. He says, To call darkness light, to call bondage liberty, is unforgivable sin. Unforgivable not because God is unwilling to forgive, but because the man who persists, like these men do, in such self-delusion refuses to accept the forgiveness which God patiently offers rebels. These men, they call evil good and good evil. They call darkness light. They call bondage freedom. There's no hope for men like this. If they turn away from the only gospel, there is. And that's what the writer of Hebrews shares in Hebrews 10. This is what he's saying right here in Hebrews 10, 26 and 27. The whole book of Hebrews is a warning not to turn away, not to turn back. In verse 26 and 27 in Hebrews 10, For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. When somebody has that much light and that much willful knowledge of Christ and the truth and they turn away from it, there's nothing left to turn to. And that's what, that's what these men are doing. And then there's always the danger, beloved, of God that He does in His, with His, in His sovereignty that at, at a given point in time, He turns a person over. We don't know when that is. But when men hear the truth and know the truth and reject the truth continually and continually, continually, you are running the risk of God completely handing you over. And that's what's happening to these men here. They are imprisoned by their sin, but they are willfully imprisoned by their sin. They love their sin and they don't want to part with it. And then verse 22, he gives the last further description just of their character, of their lives. It has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit. Do we need to even explain that, guys? You've seen it. That's what sin is like. It's like vomit. God is trying to describe these men's lives. It's signifying the filthy nature of sin. When you see a dog vomit and then go lick it up. That's what these men are doing with their sin. That was quoted after the proverb 26.11. The next one is not actually a proverb, but just a saying that was known in that day. A sow, meaning the same thing, a sow, a pig, after washing, returns to wallowing in the mire. They return to their former way of life. These men who are what? Supposed to be teachers of the Word of God. Supposed to be men of God. Their nature was never changed, in other words. A dog is a dog. He's always going to be a dog. He's always going to return to its vomit. A pig is a pig. We raised two pigs. They're nasty. They're good eating. But they waller in the mire. I understood that more after we've raised them. They just waller in it. These men, there's never been a heart change. There's no new life in Christ. There's no hatred of sin. They're still dead in their sin. They're still slaves of sin. And supposedly, speaking for God. And that brings us to our last point. You can become more aware of false teachers so as to avoid and rebuke them by understanding that they are, lastly, they're reserved for judgment. We need to understand that. We need to understand that. In verse 17b, it says, for whom the black darkness has been reserved. Look at that very next word in verse 18. I skipped that word. For. For. 
He goes from speaking about their eternal judgment to for or, or because of for speaking out arrogant words. He goes on to say how they corrupt God's people. Right? They entice God's people. And so we can connect that to see some of the severity of their judgment for because they do these things to God's people. That's what we see here. They're reserved for judgment. These men are wicked men. They prey on God's people. They prey on the church of Jesus Christ. They lead multitudes to hell. It sounds good to the unregenerate. Oh, you mean I can have Jesus and have my sin too? Yeah, let's go there. What about that man preaching repentance over there? That God will forgive you, but but you must be willing to to repent of your sin and follow Christ. And it it won't be, maybe it won't be popular. No, no, let's go this way. They promised us goodies. The blackness of darkness has been reserved for these men. That word means prepared. It's been prepared for him. It's ready. You know what it means, guys? Hell is ready to receive them. It's open. It's ready to receive these false teachers. Their destruction, as he said up in verse 3, is not asleep. Their destruction is wide awake. They may deceive the masses here on earth, but they're not deceiving the eyes of Him who sees everything. Who's abusing His church. Jesus Christ is our is our groom. We are the bride. Do you think He's not jealous of men like this? He will pour out His fury. Their destruction is not asleep. Hell is ready to receive them. Listen to these verses on hell, guys. All by Jesus Christ. Because that's what this language is. It's simply speaking about the final judgment. So just to be reminded, because we're not trying to draw in the crowds from the world, we want to teach what God's Word says. This is nothing that they would teach, but this is in the Word of God, and we need to be reminded of it. If you're not in Christ, you need to be reminded of it. This is the future of all of those, not just false teachers who die without Christ. In Matthew 13, 42, Jesus says this, speaking of the parable of the wheat and the tares. Okay? The wheat are His people. The tares are the weeds. And it says you can't even many times recognize the difference in these plants. And it says this, Jesus says, His holy angels will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What about Matthew 25, verse 41? All the goats. This is the sheep and the goats. Same thing. Goats on his left, the sheep on his right. This is representing every single person here and every single person who's ever lived and in the world, either on the left as his goats, on the right as his sheep. We know the sheep are the ones who he gave his life for. In, in John chapter 10, those are the ones who follow him, his sheep, his people. The goats says this, Then he will say to those on his left, the goats, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. You know what a characteristic of a goat is now? A characteristic of a goat is now? They mock Christ. They mock Jesus Christ. They make fun of Jesus Christ. They make fun of Christians. But folks, this is the fate of the goats. It's not a game. It's not fun in games. We should not take pleasure in knowing that. We should grieve. We should pray. We should warn not to be found in that crowd on that day. Not to be found in that crowd, but to come to your senses and understand that the one you mock is going to be the one you stand before. And then in, in a, a third example, Matthew 8, 12, he's speaking about the unbelieving Jews here. Specifically, when he says the sons of the kingdom. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast into outer darkness. That place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I read those scriptures just to simply remind us of what this phrase is talking about, beloved. This is the final judgment in hell in the lake of fire. And these men that we're looking at, they will be there. And I would have to think that they would be in the worst part of it. That place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
It will be worse for them probably than anybody else. But I'm going to tell you, secondly, who, will, who also it will be horrific for is all of those, whether you're a false teacher or not, who have had a clear knowledge of the truth and reject it. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 10, verse 15. This is after commissioning His disciples to go out and preach the Gospel to the towns. He said, when you go out and you preach, and they don't receive your message, right? We hear that a lot. They don't receive your message. They reject your message. They clearly had an understanding of the truth, of the Gospel, the good news, the message. But they reject it. Christ says this, Truly I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Did we not read about Sodom and Gomorrah a few weeks ago? In verse 6, And if He condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter. And then we even turned to Jude and looked at what that judgment is. It's not just fire on that day, but Jude, referring to Sodom and Gomorrah, it says they were destroyed and are exhibited as an example and undergoing the punishment of the eternal fire. Those in Sodom and Gomorrah, beloved, he reduced to ashes and then they went straight to hell. And Peter said, or Jesus says it's going to be worse For the person who has heard the Gospel clearly multiple times and rejects it. It's going to be worse than for those cities. For those people in those cities who live in gross immorality. The judgment will be worse. I picture that as our culture. I picture that as our nation. Gospels everywhere. Yeah, there's a lot of false Gospels, but there's a lot of true ones. There's a lot of men preaching the gospel in this nation and have been for years. On the radio, on the TV, there's churches on every corner. There's we got Bibles, as Spurgeon said, enough dust on the Bibles to write damnation on many people's Bibles. And those people who have a clear knowledge of Christ and say, No, you're in danger of the Final judgment of a worse judgment than those in Sodom and Gomorrah. And so, repent. Turn away from your sin. The song that we sang earlier, I meant to look at this earlier and I forgot. The song we sang, but as I ran my hell-bound race. Can you guys identify with that? I was headed for hell. Indifferent to the cost that Jesus Christ paid on the cross. He shed His blood. God came into the world and shed His blood to save us from that place. And and people are running there. People I love are headed there. And they, they mock this one who hung on the cross for them, the one who they will stand before. Repent. If you don't know Him, repent. Repent and believe. That's all you do. Look to Him like the thief on the cross. He looked. And He was given eternal life. He trusted in Jesus Christ. It's going to be too late one day. There's not going to be time left one day for the unbeliever. Repent. Look to Jesus Christ. Look to Jesus Christ. He's a friend of sinners. He's a friend because He tells the truth. He says, repent and come to Me and I'll have mercy on you. I'll never turn you away. If you'll come to Me, He'll never turn you away. This place called hell is horrifying. It's horrifying. I would not want my worst enemy to go there. And the message of the Gospel is now. It's now. But the door will close one day. 
the door will close and there will be no more offers. None. It will be over. So come to Him today. While it's today, do it now. Not tomorrow. Now. Here. Today. Call upon His name. And He's mighty to save. And Christian, be aware of false teachers. Like we said from the beginning, they're, they're spiritual terrorists. They don't have your best interest in mind, my best interest in mind. They don't have the loss, their best interest in mind. They have their lusts and their pocketbooks in mind. So, we, so Peter shares these things inspired by the Holy Spirit so that the people of that day and so us in our day can be aware. We can be aware of their character. We can be aware that don't believe their empty promises. They're liars. If they're not saying things like repent of your sins, come and follow Jesus Christ to escape the judgment, they're preaching a false gospel. Don't listen to them. Be strong in the Word of God so that you can avoid them, number one, so you're not polluted by them. Don't join up with them. And so that on top of that, when you're given an opportunity, you can rebuke them in a loving way. You can correct them. And you can correct those who are caught in their teaching. That's what we're seeing today. So let's, let's be strong in the Word of God. Okay, Let's be strong in the Word of God. doesn't mean that I'm always right. doesn't mean that I'm, I always get everything absolutely right. But we keep going back to the Scriptures. Right? Iron sharpening iron. So that we can so that we can communicate the true gospel to Jesus or to to the lost that Jesus Christ can save them. And so that we can disciple young believers. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for Having mercy upon us, God. We thank you for Jesus Christ. God, what a mighty Savior He is. Thank you for rescuing us. Lord, we just pray for those. We all know people, Lord, friends and family who, who do not know you, Lord. We just beg you, Father, to open their eyes. We beg you to draw them. We so desire for them to repent, Lord and believe and come and taste and see that the Lord is good Father that's what we pray that's what we desire Lord that's why we want to exist as a church to reach out to those all around us Lord perishing Father we love you so much and it's because you first loved us Lord we just want to worship you continue to worship you in this song thank you for who you are in Christ's name Amen